Welcome to the process control day. There are four modules, A, B, C, and D, that you will see as part of this third day of training. Good luck. The agenda for the process control day is basically an introduction to uh, process control. We're going to go through some basic statistics, discuss uh, process centering and process spread. That's what this module will be about. And then we're going to discuss the seven quality tools and um, control charting will be the major focus of those tools. However, we are going to ex expose you to all seven of them. You've seen this as part of the white belt, but it's important enough where we want to just uh, reemphasize it here. Um, there are two types of data. You have attribute data, which is what we consider categorical data, um, pass, fail, good, bad, um, different types of defects, um, maybe different diagnoses um, would be included here. So any, um, anything that we're going to break into different categories, causes of issues would be an attribute type data. The other type of data would be variables. This is data that we measure. This is considered continuous data as the um, different uh, uh, data that we collect here or the measurements that we would collect would be infinite. So it would be continuous uh, in its scale. Uh, examples would include weight, pressure, temperature. Um, included in this would be possibly cholesterol levels, blood pressure. Um, Anything, again, that we're measuring, uh, time would be um, a variables data here as well. Um, time associated with processing anything through your, um, your uh, particular department or through your system. So how do we get to this bell curve? You, you're going to see this uh, quite a bit. You've probably already seen it in a, in a couple of our slides. This is the bell curve. Things in nature will follow this bell curve. So if this was heights of individuals, you have fewer people to the left or as they get shorter, fewer people to the right as they get taller. Most people are average in height. So that's where we see the, the greatest amount of um, our population. So things in, in uh, nature generally follow this distribution. So if we're going to collect data from our process and we're going to do this 20 times a day for five days, we've collected these data points, we're going to get these, these numbers. And if we take and we uh, look at them over time, we can uh, see them as a uh, what we call a run chart. So this is one of the seven quality tools. With a run chart, we want to see that um, there's no patterns in this data that we don't have uh, too many that are above or below the center line. That would be our average. So um, this is a run chart. And again, we're, we don't see really any trends. It's not like they started all high and they went to the low. Um, this is what our data looks like at this point. If we were to take this chart, this run chart, and flip it upside down and shake all those points so that they fell to the bottom, we'd ha have what is called a dot plot uh, in the makings of a histogram. So taking that chart, which has the average of 100, and shaking those points down, um, basically this is the relationship that we're going to see. And, and that dot plot is starting to look an awful lot like a histogram. So here's the same data. And you can see now that this definitely does look like it would uh, resemble our bell curve. Things are not going to follow that bell curve perfectly, especially as we collect um, data. Data that we collect has got measurement variation, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through this module. Um, but what we really want to understand is that as we collect data, that we are going to have some variation due to the way that we collect it. So here's that same histogram with a uh, fitted line or a fitted uh, bell curve in there. The, um, this is an output from Minitab software, which you'll be exposed to more at the green belt level. Some of the nice things about Minitab will do for us is if you look at the top right, this shows us our average, which is our mean of 100.2. 
it gives us a standard deviation of approximately two and n is our sample size that's the amount of data points we took we took 20 for five days that's the n so two terms that i want to introduce you to right now are called the mean and the median and basically some of the statistics that you may have heard uh, talked about whether it's in political circles uh, when we're, they're talking about um, election polls or um, or other uh, data that is being analyzed sometimes they talk about the mean and sometimes they talk about the median um, when we talk about the mean the mean is the average or the uh, we'll call it the center of gravity of a particular set of data so to get to the mean we're simply going to add up all the points and we're going to divide by the number of points that's the average or that's the mean the median reflects the 50th value so if we were to rank all the uh, data from the lowest to the highest the middle point or the 50th point uh, in our data is considered our halfway point and that is considered the median okay so the median is more robust to the outliers or the extreme values and the median the excuse me the mean would be more sensitive to that so depending on the type of data you're looking at there's a reason to use the mean versus the median um, the last statement on here is if the data was normally distributed it followed that bell curve the mean and the median would be the same they would equal here's an example of calculating the mean and the median if we looked at local home prices that sold recently in the uh, neighborhood we had four homes that sold 110 120 130 140 thousand dollars each what would be the average price and what would be the median price of those two um, what I'd also like you to calculate before we get to the next screen is last week in addition to those four homes a fifth house was sold and that one sold for $5 million. This is one that was uh, up on the hill, uh, obviously a very nice estate. Um, what's that going to do for our median and what's that going to do for our average price sales? Okay, this is what we're going to consider an outlier, something that doesn't look like the rest of our data. So I'm just going to take a second here. You can pause the video to come up with your calculations. The average for the mean and the middle value for the median shouldn't take very long okay so here's our answers we add up the uh, top four and we get um, uh, 500,000 we divide by four we get 125,000 that's our average the median price or the middle value is because we have two um, in the middle we actually take the average of those two and we get 125,000. Okay, so in this particular case, our mean and our median are identical. Remember, I mentioned on, on the previous uh, couple slides that if you had data that was normally distributed, uh, didn't really have any outliers, your data should, uh, your mean and your median should look very similar or they should be the same. So now we've got an outlier. We've got this $5 million house. And what's that going to do for our? average so if we added up everything we've got five million five hundred thousand divided by five gives us an average of 1.1 million dollars the median price is the middle value and again we've ranked them lowest to highest you can see that the 130k is our middle value so the outlier significantly changed our average from 125 to 1.1 million dollars where our median price really didn't change an awful lot so when we talk about house sales the next time you you listen to uh, you know realtors or you read something in a newspaper an article and they talk about price uh, home price sales you're gonna hear the term median and uh, this is also uh, sometimes it's used in uh, describing salaries and, and household incomes they'll talk about the median price of a house or the median income of a uh, of a household because we don't really care about the 
uh, those outliers and, and the huge effect that they're going to have on an average, um, we really want to know what's, what's common for that particular area. So if you're going to move into my neighborhood and I didn't want you in my neighborhood, I, I would use something like the average and say, you know, I'd love you to move over this way, but you know, the average home sales, um, you know, were at $1.1 million. So I don't think you can afford to come into my area. Um, I'm going to be misleading people if I use the average in that particular case. Um, if you heard me say that the median price of the home sales in my neighborhood uh, was $130,000, um, you may be more likely to consider that, or you may even say, geez, you know what, that's below where um, I, sh I see myself, uh, and uh, you know, maybe we can, uh, we can visit uh, you know, at, at a, uh, a yard sale or something. Uh, or, or some other type of party, but uh, I'm not going to be moving into your house uh, or your neighborhood. So that being said, we need to be really careful on how we uh, look at data and how we present our data. So data that people are presenting, I always question it. Where did that data come from and what am I actually looking at? So question the data. That's the, uh, that's the takeaway from here. And now we know the difference between mean and median. So those two uh, were measures of where the center of my data is. Now we're going to talk about the variability of our data. This is how spread out our data is. And we've got three terms that we're going to discuss here. One is the range, one is the variance, and one is the standard deviation. We're probably very familiar with a range of data because that's the, uh, the highest subtract, uh, subtracting the lowest. Okay, so we take the lowest from the highest uh, number and we get our range of our data. That's pretty common. We've seen that. What we haven't seen is this variance and standard deviation. And you can see the symbol that we use next to standard deviation. That's the Greek symbol for sigma. That standard deviation uh, is actually the square root of the variance. So when we calculate the standard deviation, we actually are going to do that in the next couple slides we're going to calcu calculate the variance and then we're going to take the square root of that which is uh, what our standard deviation is. All right, The range, very similar to our average, is very sensitive to outliers. You can imagine that range of the, the data once we introduced that five million dollar point, well that range went from a very uh, low um, 30,000 uh, spread to a $5 million spread or close to $5 million. So now we're going to calculate the variance and the standard deviation. This comes from our data. We have five data points here, two, one, three, five, and four. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take and find the average of this data. So if we add those five points together, we get 15. We divide 15 by five we get three. So our average is three. The next thing we're going to do is subtract each one of those points, those data points from the mean. Okay. And then we're going to, we're going to take the, um, the sum of those differences. And we're going to do all this on the next slide, but this gives you a visual representation of the data relative to the average three. So the X bar was our average of three, and here's our data. Our data is in X. Uh, we have our two, one, three, five, and four. We're going to subtract that from three. So uh, in each case, you see what we get. Uh, two minus three is minus one. One minus three is minus two. Three minus three is zero. Five minus three is two, and four minus three is one. I hope no one's getting lost in this math. And by the way, the software will calculate all this for you. I'm just showing this to you so you know where it comes from. The next thing we're going to do is square that term. So we're going to square this, these differences. And if we square a negative number, we're going to get a positive number. So we get 1, 4, 0, 4, and 1. And then what we're going to do is we're going to add that together. We're going to add all those numbers together. And by adding them together, we are going to get 10. 1, 4, 4, and 1 is 10. And we're going to divide that by 
n minus 1. Now, if you remember from, um, I think it was the last module where we showed you n was our sample size. Our sample size here is 5. So we're going to take 5 minus 1 and get 4. And we're dividing that 10 by 4 and we're getting 2.5. That's our, our variance. Okay, so our variance of our data here is 2.5. We take the square root of 2.5. That's going to be our standard deviation. And our standard deviation is approximately 1.58. The formula here to the right of that is the sum of all of our x's subtracted from the average of that data. It's the square of that divided by our total number of samples divided by 1. I'm sorry, excuse me. The, um, total number of our samples n minus 1 and we're going to then take that and take the square root of that. That's our standard deviation. So it's the sum of the square differences of our av from our average divided by our sample size minus 1 and then it's the square root of that. So now that we know how to calculate standard deviation and we know that uh, our range and our variance uh, in addition to standard deviations about our spread, we can start to look at how wide our data is and we can start to compare it to specification limits. Okay, A traditional view is basically a pass or fail. Um, is, my, is my data somewhere between my specification limits? When we start to look at things statistically, we want to know how close to nominal are we and we want to stay away from our lower and upper spec limits. So a more traditional view is that pass-fail. The newer view and newer way to look at things is looking at data so that um, we understand where exactly within the specification limits that we are. So LSL and USL are lower spec limit and upper spec limit. Um, So when we analyze data, we want to look at data over time to see if that data is stable. We're going to be reviewing that in upcoming modules here as part of the process control day. One of the other things we're going to do is we're going to locate that process mean. I want to know where that is. Where is my average? Okay. And then we're also going to look at the variability, and that's my standard deviation. So I want to then compare my mean, my variability to my customer specification limits. Okay, we want to understand whether our process is capable or not and we want to be able to determine uh, what other influences are affecting that data and the variability of the data.